All right, it is top of the hour and um, welcome back to the applications uh, session. We have Richard Barrett from Sandia. He will speak about exploring Chapel productivity using some graph algorithms. Okay, thanks so much for having me. Um, super cool, everybody to be sharing their work is really interesting, thank you. Um, so we have a, a project looking at, uh, uh, actually the performance is our focus of, of Chapel, and this is our team. Uh, a lot of performance people, as you can see, um, I've been away from Chapel for a while and I, I'm happy to be back and I brought some people with me. Stephen Olivier has, has done some work with Chapel too in the past. So again, we're looking at the performance of some linear algebra based graph analytics. In particular, we're using uh, uh, the computation of, uh, of computing some hitting time movements and triangle enumeration. And the key kernels for this are sparse matrix vector and matrix matrix multiplication. Um, we have some existing C++ and MPI codes that we will be comparing our performance with. Uh, not yet, this is still a fairly early project, um, but ultimately once we get things going, we will compare with it. So my outline is I'm going to give a very brief overview of, of graph hitting time, talk about the key computations, so show some performance, and then give a preview of the triangle enumeration, and then a summary. <clears throat> So graph hitting time. So if I have some relational data and I can organize it into a graph, I might ask a question, how long does it take to go from one vertex to another? Or I might identify some subset of the vertices and ask how long it takes to get to the others. This is not an optimization problem. We're not looking for the shortest path. We're looking, we're doing a random walk and we're just looking for some statistics on, on how that goes. So here's where the linear system comes from. A very simple under, and it's a simple undirected graph. Simple meaning there's no more than two, uh, one connection between any two vertices. That's the adjacency matrix on the right. And from this, uh, we configure this linear system. D is the uh, vertex degrees. That is just the sum of the rows of the adjacency matrix. And then we saw four linear systems to get what uh, graph people call the, the hitting time moments, mean standard deviation, skew, and kurtosis. Kurtosis says something about the thickness of the tail of the distribution. The key kernel is the matrix vector product because we are able to solve this using the conjugate gradient algorithm. This is a uh, symmetric positive definite matrix. So given that, the, the, the key to getting performance out of this, the sparse matrix vector product is how we store the sparse matrix. We would like to use the Chapel uh, sparse domain, and we will in the future, but in discussions with Brad and some others, um, he, he tells us that's not yet performant. Uh, we hope to be a forcing function to get there, uh, but we're gonna use our own uh, for the time being. Um, our, we are using uh, the sparse domain in, in our triangle enumeration in a pretty, pretty cool way, I think, and I'll, I'll briefly say something about that. Okay, so if I'm going to store my matrix just in coordinate format, I need four, uh, three arrays, each storing the row index, column indices, and the values of the non-zeros, right? Turns out, because this is an adjacency matrix, all the, the non-zeros are one, so I don't actually need that, that array, so I save one array. We're also looking at uh, row compressed format, which saves a little space and, and maybe one extra bit of indirection. Um, so, so here, here's a thing. When I allocate these arrays and load it up with the row and column indices, um, I may, when I, when I divide this across locales, I may uh, divide it such that row indices from one row span two locales. And I don't want to do that. That's some extra communication. It's pretty easy to avoid that. So we implemented this, what I call padding. I just expand the arrays a little bit so that all of the row indices on the first locale or on, on that locale. And then, then if I have to add a little padding, and I do, I, I'll call that zero padding to the other locale so that they're all the same length when, I, when, I, when Chapel divides the locales uh, evenly, all of the row indices are on the same locale. Okay, and then we configured a very simple example uh, to explore this. And, and so here's the graph. And I configured it this way so that I would get a banded matrix. And that's what A is showing there. The diagonals are uh, non-zeros are represented with uh, 
colored diagonal lines. In this case, it's got a bandwidth of two. Um, pretty, pretty simple matrix. You'll see that the, the interlocal communication should just be with nearest neighbors. And that's what I'm showing here. I'm showing that, so this middle locale, let's call it locale one. Uh, the gray area is what I'm going to multiply. That's the matrix that I have there, and I'm going to multiply it by this X vector. Again, in blue is what is local to the locale, and Y is where my answer is going to be. Um, the green is the data that I need to collect from my, my neighbor locales. Okay. I hesitate to show this because this is very preliminary, and I'm sure there's there's something pretty simple that uh, Pitbull is going to be able to offer us, and maybe some others. Um, but I'm going to show you this just just as a, a for the purposes of of discussion. So uh, the x axis is the number of nodes, one locale per node. These are uh, Haswell processors on a Cray XC, so they're uh, 32 cores each. Uh, the y-axis is time in seconds. Uh, the colors represent different uh, numbers of vertices. The green is 10,000 vertices, the red is 50,000, the blue is uh, 100,000. B means whether or not I use the load balancing uh, technique I just described. And as you can see, the, the performance when I go from one locale to two uh, is, is very poor. Um, we have to figure out what's going on here. I think it's, it's gonna be a pretty simple fix um, and we expect to get back on track. Um, it's also interesting to note that as I go from two uh, up to multiple locales, at least for the green and the blue, the performance either gets better or pretty much stays the same. Um, in, in profiling this using HPC Toolkit, um, we're not able to get it a lot just yet. And that's something I want to talk about too, the, the tool uh, support here. But we are able to see user time versus, I'm calling it runtime. It's the, the chapel stuff going on beneath, uh, below the hood. The green uh, is the user time and the red is, is uh, that underneath the hood time. And, and I'm showing this as a percentage. So on one locale, 85% of the time is in, in the user code and then uh, 15% is in, in the runtime. But as we go to multiple cores, that inverts dramatically. And my hypothesis is that's, that's uh, something happening with the, the inter-process communication, inter-locale communication, and that's what I think we need to address. But that's just speculation. Um, one thing we really hope to get at um, for this, as someone mentioned before, are, are better tools. I've really enjoyed using HPC Toolkit for my MPI codes and whatnot. Uh, it's a very powerful tool out of, out of Rice University by some compiler folks. They really know how to dig into things and, uh, and, and get at the heart of things. So maybe, maybe that's a, a future technology we can have. Yeah, I just said some of, some of this about performance tools. Um, Craypad has also been a favorite tool of mine, but it no longer is supporting Chapel because they claim that we haven't been pushing on them too. So I'd like to, uh, if I can, get your support in, in pushing on them to, to get back to that support because Craypad's a very powerful tool. Our, our uh, performance folks are also using LDMS um, and they've been having, they've been struggling with that a bit but uh, have some ideas on how to, how to fix that. There's also a tool called Chapel Blamer out of uh, University of Maryland, ri actually written by a, a graduate student, I think, who's no longer there. I'm not sure what the support is on that, but that, that was a pretty neat tool as well if we could get, get that back up to speed. Okay, triangle enumeration. So again, we're not counting triangles, we're actually identifying them. So for that simple graph again that I showed before, in this case, I'm again forming an adjacency matrix. If it were dense, it'd be trivial to find where the triangles are, right? If I, if I have uh, two vertices ij and another two ik, I just look at the dense matrix and I will see if there's a one in position jk. We don't have that, this is sparse so that we can store much larger graphs. So I form what's called an incidence matrix, and that, that uh, describes the relationship between vertices and edges. So the columns are edges. So I, I've highlighted uh, row five and column five. 
uh, of the two matrices. So if when I multiply, quote unquote, multiply um, those two uh, circle adjacency entries and incident edge incident entries, I would get the number two. I don't care about the number two. If there are two things to multiply, then those two vertices, J and K, share an edge. Column two, four of the adjacency matrix share an edge. And therefore, I know I have it. And, and in talking with Brad about this, he came up with a really neat idea or observation and idea is that we don't actually need the values. Again, I don't care what the answer is. I only care that there are two things that get multiplied together. And when I do that, I know I have a triangle. And so, so we formed a, uh, we're, we're just um, implementing the domains and operating on those. There are no, no values. I hope to report on that pretty soon as well. Okay, just in summary, scaling performance is currently poor. Uh, that's probably on me, um, but we're looking forward to uh, getting with the, the chapel performance folks and really, really uh, digging into that. I showed a very simple example, the banded matrix, but we're not gonna have anything that simple. So we won't assume any graph structure. We're looking at these different storage formats, really hope to get to the chapel source domain. Uh, one thing I would like to, to call out, and maybe it's there, maybe I just don't understand it, but in C, we call it a function pointer. So when I solve a linear system, I pass, a, I want to pass a matrix vector uh, product function into conjugate gradient and let it operate on that. That lets me have a much more complicated uh, matrix vector product capability. I'm shouting again about the need for performance tools to really dig in and, and, and be able to find where the issues are. Um, we're going to be looking at additional processors, and I really am happy to hear, hear uh, Elliot talk about the different interconnects. We do have a Cray XC that does have that, that top interconnect, but uh, we, we're interested in commodity as well. And matrix in place just means that in, in general, this hitting set idea and the triangle enumeration are not standalone applications are part of a bigger application and so I don't really want to form the adjacency matrix I just operate on it where it is uh, okay that's that's my talk thank you thanks a lot Richard um, while waiting for uh, questions to come uh, I think you may have mentioned it but uh, I may have missed it your performance results are for distributed memory right the results that you presented Yes. Have you run any uh, scalability in a single node uh, setting? Um, no, we have not. Actually, I think I may have originally, and it, and it looked pretty good. Um, okay. And I, I really haven't focused on that. Yeah, I'm really, really going for the chapel idea of just saying we're going in a node, and it's real easy to do, and I, I'm, I'm going to do it this way. Okay. Right? And also why we're not linking to Petsy or anything else. Okay. And Brian Dolan asks, uh, can you summarize why the sparse library wouldn't work? I assume he's talking about the sparse domain and array support in uh, Chapel. It, it will work. And in fact, again, we're using it in the triangle enumeration uh, uh, mini app. But uh, I'm not sure. Brad, do you want to address that or Elliot or anybody? Uh, yeah, I can jump in. So <laughs> Richard and I, when he started this project, sat down for a few days and talked through various things. And one of the things we were deciding between was whether to have him use the sparse features and potentially constantly be running up against issues that we would have to fix um, versus whether he'd want to take a more manual approach to the sparsity where he had more control but was losing some of the power in the language. And um, for whatever reason, I think based on that discussion and visit, visit we decided to go the more manual approach for now. But uh, my hope is that we will also look at more what it would look like using the sparse features and use that as a forcing function to bring them more up to speed. Is that about right, Richard? Is that the way you remember it? Yeah, very good. And and uh, I really appreciated you, you telling me about that and it will be nice to have the uh, other storage formats available for folks who, who wanna try that. But I, I really think that Chapel sparse domain is a very powerful construct. Yeah, thanks. I was also going to say, you know, Richard said that the performance might be his fault. It may be my fault as well. I'm, uh, yesterday, I was remembering that Richard sent me a mail a few weeks ago asking if we could do some pair programming, and I've been so buried with Chew, I never got back to it. So I, I hope we'll get a chance to do that uh, maybe in the next few weeks or so. 
Richard, if you're available. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, I'll take you up on that pretty quickly, I hope. We're hoping to put in an uh, HPC, HPEC paper. Okay, cool. And yeah, the, I, I think it's going to be pretty simple here, Brad, and I, I you know, I, I really wanted to talk here, really wanted to show what we're up to, but uh, I think it's going to be an easy fix. Right, okay. Pitbull? <laughs> I'm sure we've got it. <laughs> Uh, we have five minutes to next talk uh, from Nikhil Padmanaban. Um, if he can try setting up, that would be nice. And meanwhile, we can still try to answer some of the questions. Uh, we, I see some uh, question in the chat box from Sinan Aksoy. Uh, he's asking whether you know to what extent your hitting time computational methods could be applied to directed graphs. I'm not sure if I'm reading the question right. Am I? Oh, there's a chat. Uh, could you repeat that question again? I'm not sure I understand. Um, yeah, word by word, it says, do you know to what extent your hitting time computational methods could be applied to directed graphs? Oh, very good. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, I sit next to colleagues who are actually the graph people and, and doing this work. I am not a graph person. I'm starting to learn it a bit and just focusing on performance. I could put you in touch with those folks if you like. All right, uh, we have some more questions from Brian Dolan, uh, whether the code is available. Uh, no one. It, it will be, yes. Once we get things sorted out, that is the goal. And the next one is whether you are moving towards more graph plus implementation. Yeah, great question, Brian. Thanks very much. Um, in fact, one of our consultants on this, John Berry, is on the, the graph laws um, forum and is really interested in asking uh, in that work. Um, we are considering that. John seemed to suggest there was some, uh, uh, it, it might not be a perfect match with the graph laws. And that's something we'd like to speak with the forum about to, to support this sort of thing. And maybe it does, I'm speaking out of turn here, sorry. But uh, yes, we're definitely gonna look at graph laws. All right, uh, I am not seeing any other questions. Uh, thanks a lot again, Richard. Great talk and great work. Thank you.